This video will cover section 6.5, trigonometric form of a complex number. The objectives will be to plot complex numbers in the complex plane and find absolute values of complex numbers. Write, the second one is write the trigonometric forms of complex numbers, and the third one is to multiply and divide complex numbers written in trigonometric form. I want to remind you that in Pre-Cal 1, 13, 14, or um, in chapter, chapter 2 of your textbook, there is a section dedicated to complex numbers. I believe it's 2.1 um, or 2.2 it could be. And those are numbers that contain the letter I, and that will be the imaginary part. So what we're doing in this chapter, chapter 6, is use those complex numbers to write them in trigonometric form. Um, the next objective, use the Moivre's theorem to find powers of complex numbers. I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it right, but I don't speak French. Then to find the nth roots of complex numbers. Here we use the letter n to generalize. It could be the fourth root, the fifth root, the seventh root, the hundredth root. So n is just a, um, a positive uh, integer. So we start here with the complex plane. And it is similar to the xy axis, so what we're saying here is that the horizontal axis is going to represent the real axis, and the vertical axis is going to represent the imaginary axis. So every number in standard form, um, it does contain the real part. So that number will represent the real part. And then um, the, the letter A is, is accounting for the real part. It's standing for a number. And then the letter B is uh, representing a number as well. And that number will be the coefficient of I, which will account for the imaginary part of the number. So if we want to plot them, we will simply take those two numbers, the real part that will give us the horizontal coordinate and the imaginary part will give us the vertical coordinate. So um, for example, we have here the number 3 plus i. So we know that the real part is a 3 and so that's why we have it, uh, you could see the point graph there. And the imaginary part, even though we don't have a coefficient for the letter i, it is is still a 1. So then we will go 1 up vertically. And you can see how we plot the point right here. And so we, of course, follow the normal graphing that we use with the xy axis. Three, uh, the horizontal coordinate first, in this case the real coordinate first, and then the vertical one, which is uh, in this case the imaginary. And so that is the representation of the number three point, I'm sorry, three plus i in the complex plane. So in case you forgot about complex numbers, they are the big set. And then from there, we do have real and we have imaginary. Um, what we work with most of the time is with real numbers, but like I said in chapter in section 2.1, I think, you worked with imaginary. Now, both of them are subsets of the complex number. So you could have a real number, uh, for example, 5, but still written in complex form, it will be 5 plus 0 i. It just happens that the imaginary part, is e the coefficient is equal to 0, and that's why it's just real. But that means that it's still a complex number. And for imaginary, we could have numbers that are, for example, I don't know, negative 2 minus 5 i. Or we could have something that just contains, to say, 4 i. And that is because the real part happens to be zero. 
In this case, we call those pure imaginary. That was section 2.2. And so we're just going to extend those concepts, how to add them, multiply them, uh, when they are in trigonometric form. So once again, real axis is the horizontal one, and the imaginary axis is the vertical. So the complex plane, the absolute value of the complex number, A plus BI, this is the standard form of a complex number. is defined as the distance between the origin and the point AB. And remember that that point comes from the real part and the imaginary part. So to measure that distance, um, we could use the distance formula if we were measuring the distance from any point. But in this case, since we're measuring it from the origin, and then we could use something similar to Pythagorean theorem. and um, so imagine if you have, I'm going to go back to the previous slide. So if we want to find the distance from this point to the origin, we already know that the um, horizontal length is a 3 and the vertical one is a 1 if this was to be a triangle. And so it makes sense that to find uh, the missing value here, we'll call it Z. Um, for that, we will use Pythagorean theorem. So in this case, Z will be the square root of the horizontal component square, uh, or the real part square, plus the vertical or the imaginary one square. And from here, it will be the square root of 4 plus 1. So we just leave it in a radical form because that is the exact answer. And so that will be the answer for it um, about the absolute value, actually. I'm missing the absolute value here. And so that's the way we will calculate it. Also, I, I just noticed that we didn't show how this point was graphed, but you could see how the real part was a negative 2. So we could see the negative 2 there. And then the imaginary part was a negative 1. And you could see the negative 1 is being graphed here. So the point, it happens to be here. And here are the coordinates for it to negative 2, comma, negative 1. So going back to the slide, uh, the absolute value of the complex number is going to be represented by the square root of a squared plus b squared. When the complex number a plus bi is a real number, that is, if b is 0, if we had this uh, equaling to 0, uh, let's say like a 5 plus 0i, that would be just a real number. The definition agrees with that given for the absolute value of a real number, a square, and then you take the square root. So imagine if we had 5, the absolute value of 5 plus 0i. Uh, so it will be the square root of the real part only plus the square root, I mean, sorry, the square of the real part and then the square of the imaginary part that happens to be a zero. So in this case, we will have 25 plus zero, which is just 25. And so for the absolute value of square root of 25, it will be five. And, it, and only the principal square root, the positive one, because we're talking about absolute value. Absolute value is always positive. So we have our first example here, and it says, find the absolute value of a complex number. We have our complex number here. And so we're finding the absolute value of that number. So we're finding the absolute value of negative 2 plus 5i. And so remember, we just need the square root of the square of the real part, which is negative 2. So I'm going to put that negative 2 in parentheses. And then the formula tells us that we have to square it as well. Then um, for the imaginary part, we just take the number 5, and we are going to square it as well. This is positive. It's not needed for me to put it in parentheses, but it's just good practice. So here we're going to have the square root of 4 plus 25, and that gives us the square root of 
29. 29 is a prime number. It's not a perfect square, obviously. So that will be the exact answer. Now, if WebAssign wants you to, um, to round to give an approximate answer, then you will enter that on your calculator and, of course, round accordingly. So let's see what the rounding will come up to. So I have my calculator. We're going to enter the square root of 29. Enter. And we get that number. So it is going to be 5.3851. Let's say that. 5.3851. So let's assume that my math lab, I'm sorry, web assign is asking you to round to the nearest tenth. Oh, I'm missing an N. Tenth. And so that means one digit after the decimal point, right? So then you will look at the second digit. Since it's bigger than five, then your digit here is going to be 5.4. Uh, the three will go up. Now, if it says to round to the nearest hundredth or two digits after the decimal point, then this eight it's going to either go up or stay the same depending on the third number. So the 5 is going to make the 8 go up. So then this will be 5.39. Now let's say that it says uh, web assign requires you to round to the nearest thousandth. So three digits after the decimal point. So then we look at the four digits since it is a 1 then the 5 is going to stay like it is. So it will be 5.385. And so that's how you will round your answer. But the exact answer will be the square root of 29. And it is very important that you put your negative numbers in parentheses so that you don't forget that when you square them, they will always be positive. Now to add and subtract, um, multiply and divide complex numbers that was something that was covered in section 2.2 like i said or 2.1 however let me give you a quick review of that so let's pretend that we have 5 plus 2i and then we're going to add um negative 3 uh plus 4i so if we do that i'm going to go ahead and clear the parentheses of course 5 plus 2i minus 3 plus 4i. The signs remain the same because I have a positive sign here. And then what I'm going to do is combine the real parts. So 5 and negative 3. I want to say combine. It's, it could be an add or subtract depending on the sign. So here 5 minus 3 is 2. And then we're going to go ahead and combine the imaginary parts. And that will be positive 6i. And that's it. That's how you add them. Now, let's say that if we wanted to subtract them, and I'm going to use the same numbers. So in this case, because I have a negative sign in front of the parentheses, I need to distribute that negative sign to both the real and the imaginary part. So the first complex number stays the same, 5 plus 2i. And now after I distribute the negative sign, I'm going to have positive 3 and negative 4i. So it's, that's why it's very important to keep using parentheses so that you don't forget to distribute the negative sign all across. So then same thing, I'm going to combine the real parts. Now I have 5 plus 3 is 8. And then I'm going to combine the imaginary parts. So 2i minus 4i is going to be negative 4i. So that is how you add and subtract. Now let's say that you're multiplying. So if we were to multiply, let's say, 2 minus 3i times 4 plus, um, let's say, i. So in this case, uh, we will multiply just like we, if we were multiplying two binomials. Um, imagine that i is just x. So we will take, we will distribute this 2 to both the 4 and the uh, imaginary part. So in this case, we will have 2 times 4 plus 2 times i. Then we will take the imaginary part with the i included and with the negative side included, 
and distribute it to the 4 and the i. So that will give me negative 3i times 4 is negative, well, let's just write it down here, negative 3i times 4. And then we're going to say negative 3i times i. And then we're going to go ahead and multiply this number. So we're going to have 8 plus 2i minus 12i and then minus 3i squared because we're multiplying i times i. And there is a definition that in case you don't remember it, I'm going to write it here. i is equal by definition to the square root of negative 1. Yes, the negative inside the square root. And i squared is equal to negative 1. So what we do is every time you find an i squared, you replace that with a negative 1. So in this case, we have, and I'm going to go ahead and combine the two here in the middle that have i. So I'm going to have 8 minus 10i minus 3, and I'm going to replace the negative, the i squared with negative 1. And so that will cause the negative 3 to become a positive 3. So now I have um, 8 minus 10i plus 3. And now I'm going to combine the real parts, which is 8 plus 3. And that will give me 11 and then minus 10i. And remember, in standard form, we always have the real part first and then the imaginary part second. So now, um, well, in division, division is something that you have to have uh, the concept of complex conjugates uh, already um, in mind because the way we will divide, or even if this was something more complicated, let's say negative 5 plus 2i, something like that. So to make to perform that division, we will have to multiply top and bottom by the complex conjugate of the number of the denominator. And so the complex conjugate will be the exact same thing as the denominator, but the sign in the middle assigned to the imaginary part will be the opposite. So if it's positive, the complex conjugate will have negative or vice versa. And so we multiply top and bottom and then we reduce it and that's how we get rid of imaginary numbers in the denominator but i'm not going to do that uh if you are if you need some clarification uh you could google how to divide complex numbers i know you're pretty good at that so to work effectively with powers and roots of complex numbers it is helpful to write complex numbers in trigonometric form, believe it or not. And so here in the figure that you see on your right, 3.36, consider the non-zero complex number A plus BI. So again, A is the real part. You can see here on the real axis. And then B is the imaginary part. And you could see it here on the um um vertical axis which is the imaginary axis and you could see it here now here b is just happens to be negative and that is okay the real or the imaginary part can be negative or both could be negative and so what we're going to do there is after plotting the point by considering the real and imaginary parts uh we're going to measure the angle that comes from the positive real axis and it has its terminal side um, on the length on the um, on the line or segment that is going from the origin to your complex number and so that will be the angle that we will be using so the way we will find that angle as you could see here um, <clears throat> if we were to calculate Let's say, and, and I'm going to say, I'm going to use the reference angle, not theta. Um, although we could still do it with theta, but okay. Let's say if we want to 
calculate the sine of theta prime. Um, and I'm using theta prime just because we have the triangle here in the second quadrant. Um, so if we want to do that using triangles, it will be the opposite side times the hypotenuse, which is denoted by R. And if we wanted to calculate the cosine of that angle, theta prime, it will be the adjacent side, which is A, divided by the hypotenuse, which is represented by the letter R. And if I want to solve for A and B, which is pretty much what we have here, A is representing the real part and B is representing the imaginary part. So if I want to solve for them, you can see how R is dividing the letter. So if I take that letter across, it's going to be multiplying. So it will be R times sine of theta prime equals B. And then for the other one, we'll leave the A there. Take the R that is dividing to the A and take it across. So it will be multiplying. So it will be R times cosine of theta prime. And I know here on the next slide, they're not using theta prime, but I mean, I, it's okay. I just use that because we were looking at the triangle. So you could see that the same thing is written here. So to find A, the real part, we will use R cosine theta. And to find B, which is the imaginary part or the coefficient of I, we will be using R sine theta. Um, so how do we find r so r remember is the distance from that origin the point zero zero to the point uh the coordinates of the point that you get from graphing a complex number in standard form which are denoted by a comma b meaning real comma imaginary part um, so that's how we find R by taking the square root of it. That's how we started the lesson. And so consequently, if we replace the real part A with this expression, we have it there. And then if we replace B with the expression that we wrote down here, R sine theta, we have it here. However, we still need to um, include the letter I. Now, I don't want you to get confused with the section of vectors with the unit vectors i and j. Here we are talking about complex numbers or imaginary numbers. So this is not the same as what we saw with vectors with the i and j components. So from here, this is what we call the trigonometric form of a complex number. So this will be a complex number in standard form. And the one on the left right here is the trigonometric form of a complex number. So if you notice, both of them contain the letter R, which represents the the radius or the distance from the origin to that point and so if we factor if we factor that r out we will get cosine theta plus sine theta and then i or we could actually put i in the front so we don't think that is part of the angle so there's i we have our real part here times r of course and then the imaginary one times r so i just factor r out and that is what we can see here on the next slide that is the trigonometric form of any complex number so you could have r here as long as you have parentheses around the rest and then you will have your real part comes from cosine theta and your imaginary part comes from i times sine theta I is just going to stay there as a variable to indicate that that is the imaginary part. So we already know from the previous two slides that A is equal to R cosine theta and B is equal to R sine theta. So that is the real part. We have it here. 
and then we have our imaginary part and that comes from r sine theta and that is for b and then of course we know how r is the distance and we already know that we have to take that square root of the real part square plus the imaginary part square so um since we're talking about triangles and we are supposed to have a and b if you do have a triangle and you have an angle here and let's say you know this is a and this is b and you want to find a trigonometric ratio with it so you have the opposite and you have the adjacent so if we find the tangent of that angle it's going to be b over a and so with that equation that we also use with vectors to find the angle in between them um, it's going to to solve for theta we will have to take the tangent inverse of B over A, just like you were supposed to do in section 6.4 or 6.3, one of those, or both. So, uh, and then here again, R is also, we call it the modulus of Z. And theta, the angle, is going to be called the argument of Z. The trigonometric form of a complex number is also called the polar form. And in chapter 10, we are going to look at polar graphs. And um, because there are infinitely many choices for theta, uh, remember how those are, they repeat every, every two pi, or in the case of tangent, every pi, the trigonometric form of a complex number is not unique. So we have infinitely many choices uh, just because of theta. Normally, theta is restricted to this interval, just like we did in some equations. So it's going to be from 0 to 2 pi. So this as an interval will have 0 included and 2 pi not included. So we use regular parentheses. So this means that your angle theta needs to be positive greater than 0, including 0. It could be 0 because we have that equal part here, but it cannot go past 2 pi. Although on occasion, it is convenient to use theta less than zero so sometimes it's more convenient to use uh, an angle that an angle that is negative or greater i'm sorry less than zero so we have here example number two trigonometric form of a complex number and it says write the complex number z equals negative two minus two the square root of three times i in trigonometric form so we have here the real part and we have here the imaginary part. So the absolute value is uh, of that number, and we need that to find r. So it's going to be the, hor the real part square. And you notice how the negative 2 is placed inside parentheses. And then the imaginary part squared. So again, we, we keep that in parentheses, and then we square it. So we have to perform the squares first. So negative 2 squared is 4. And then th for this part, we have to square the negative 2. But we also have to square the square root of 3. So in this case, uh, I will get 4. I'm going to write it here on the left. I will get negative 2 squared is 4 positive. And then from here, from squaring a square root, you get rid of the square root, so it's 3. So 4 times 3 is 12. And so that is what we actually write down here. So now we can add the two numbers inside. That will be um, not a plus, but an equal. That will be the square root of 16. So now we know that r is going to be the square root of 16, which is 4. I know the square root of 16 could also be negative 4, but in this case, we're talking about absolute value. So it makes sense that we only use the positive root. So at this point, we know that r is equal to 4. We also know that a, a is equal to negative 2. And 
b is equal to negative 2 square root of 3. So we have those three numbers. So now to find to find what um, theta will be, because we need that to write our number in tri trigonometric form, we need r, that's one of those things, but we also need the angle. So we're going to use tangent of um, theta is equal to b over a. So we're going to say tangent of theta is b. b is equal to this number, negative 2 square root of 3, divided by, remember, b goes on top, the imaginary part, divided by a, which is uh, the real part, and that is equal to negative 2. So if we divide negative 2 by negative 2, uh, we say they cancel, but that's because they equal to 1. So in this case, we have tangent of theta is equal to the square root of 3. So it does make sense that to find theta, we have to find the tangent inverse of the square root of 3. And I'm going to do that with the calculator to show you what it will happen. Now, recall that the tangent is positive in quadrants 1 and in quadrant 3. But the tangent inverse formula is only defined in quadrants 1 and 4. This is for tangent inverse. And so um, whatever we put on the calculator, it, it could give us the wrong answer. So let's see, tangent inverse of the square root of 3. So second tangent inverse and then the square root of positive 3, I believe. So I'm going to close the parentheses, press enter, and that gives me 60. So that means 60. I have my calculator set in degrees. So that's 60 degrees. So theta is equal to 60 degrees. Or in radians, that will be pi over 3. So what I need to do is um, I need you guys to think about plotting this point. So if we were to plot this point, it will have the coordinates negative 2, comma, negative 2 square root of 3. So you could see that both the real and the imaginary part are negative and so those two will definitely be plotted in quadrant three so the answer that we're getting from the calculator has nothing to do with quadrant three those answers are in quadrant one so we have to translate our answer into terms of quadrant three so to figure that out we're going to go pi over 3 radians or 60 degrees past pi. So that angle will start here on the positive um, real axis and it will go to pi but then it will go another pi over 3 radians more or 60 degree radians more and that's actually what the angle will be. So that angle will be 180 plus 60, so it will be um, uh, 240 degrees, or we could say it will go pi plus pi over three, so that will be three pi over three plus one pi over three, so it will be four pi over three. That is the correct answer. You cannot trust your calculator at all times. You have to actually plot the point and see in what quadrant it will be and then modify the answer you get with the calculator so that it fits the actual point. Now you can see here the same thing that I did on the previous slide, the plot, uh, the plotting of the point. We have here the real part, negative 2, and we have the imaginary part. So if we follow those coordinates, you could see the clearly that the, the terminal, I mean the point, is going to be in quadrant 3. So that's why for the angle, we have to find an angle in quadrant 3, which we decided it was 4 pi over 3. And you can see that here, it was pi plus pi over 3. So this was 3 pi over 3 plus 1 pi over 3. And this is equal to 4 pi over 3. So now to find the trigonometric form, recall that R 
r was equal i have to look at it again r was r was equal to four so now we're going to go ahead and do our substitution here and then for our angles here and here that's all we got to substitute now and we're going to substitute the angle with four pi over three so let's get started so z equals r which is four parentheses cosine of pi over three oops i just wrote theta but i should put four pi over three and then plus i sine of the angle again which is four pi over three now we do close parentheses to close the one that we opened here right after the four and now what we need to do is simplify it a little bit so we know well actually that will be the answer if they ask us to give it to leave it in trigonometric form now if the question was to write this number so this is the answer okay that's the end if the question was write this number in standard form so that will be without cosine and sine So then what we will do is to actually carry out this operation. So the cosine of 4 pi over 3, I believe, is negative 1 half. And then um, do you guys see how I replace that whole thing just with the ratio? I don't have cosine anymore. And that was a big mistake on the first exam. That you guys were still leaving those um, uh, sine and cosine there. And then I and I replace sine of 4 pi over 3 and that is going to be negative square root of 3 over 2 so oh and actually the 4 is multiplying both so it will I have to distribute the 4 so it will be negative 4 over 2 plus negative 4 square root of 3 over 2 and then I could put I here and then simplifying this, negative 4 over 2, it will be negative 2. And then here, negative 4 over 2 will be negative 2, square root of 3, and then i. So here we have the number in standard form. And that's actually the question that we started with. Negative 2 minus 2 times square root of 3. And then I'm missing i somewhere here. So I'm going to go ahead and add it there. Um, so yeah, it does work. You could go from one side to the other. So now, um, now that we learn how to convert a standard of complex number in standard form to the trigonometric complex form, uh, let's go ahead and look at multiplication and division of complex numbers. So the trigonometric form adapts nicely to multiplication and division of complex numbers and we say nicely because there's actually a, a very nice shortcut that we're going to look at so suppose you're given two complex numbers and we're going to call them z sub one and z sub two so those are our two complex numbers they are in trigonometric complex form so you could notice they don't they have r and you can see that r1 and r2 uh, they have different subscript just so that it matches the complex number then from here we do have the same cosine and sine however the angles are different we have theta sub 1 to match the number and here we have theta sub 2 to much to match the subscript of the number so same thing here theta sub one and then theta sub two however the other parts are still the same cosine cosine i sine and i sine so r is different and so is the angle theta so to multiply those two numbers to multiply z sub one and z sub two what we're going to do is 
multiply multiply r r sub 1 times r sub 2 and then um, we are going to add the angles um, now how do we come to that conclusion well if we were to multiply cosine theta sub 1 times cosine theta sub 2 we will get this product here okay then if we multiply what are we going to multiply now okay so i feel like here they're already omitting the i square okay so if we were to multiply cosine theta sub 1 times i theta sub 1 i'm just going to write my own so it will be cosine theta sub 1 times cosine theta sub 2 then we multiply cosine theta sub 1 times i sine theta sub 2 um, and then we multiply this quantity times cosine so we will get plus i sine theta sub 1 times cosine of theta sub 2 and then finally we will multiply this quantity times this one here and that will give us positive i square and then sine of theta sub 1, sub one times sine of theta sub 2 and recall how we said that anytime we encounter i square we're going to replace that with a negative one and so from there there's uh it comes that negative one or simply just the negative sign in front of it like that so after um combining terms and uh, putting putting together the ones that contain i which is like here and here um, if we factor out i, like it's being done here, we will get sine, or here, uh, we will get sine of theta sub 1 times cosine of theta sub 2, that is here, and then plus cosine of theta sub 1 times sine of theta sub 2, that's right here. And you can see the i is being represented there. It was factored out. And then for the ones, the two terms that do not contain i, we have the one here, cosine theta sub 1 times cosine theta sub 2 is here. And then we have the minus, you could see it here, and then sine theta sub 1 times sine theta sub 2. And so those two are actually formulas from that section um, I believe it's 5.4 the um, the sum the cosine of the sine the cosine of the sum of two angles the cosine of the difference of two angles the sine of the sum of two angles and the sine of the difference of two angles and so in reality this part of the formula right here is what represents the cosine of the addition of two angles and that's from section 5.4 and the part that we see here 
that is the formula that represents the sign of the addition of two angles. So like I was mentioning before, the first step is to multiply r sub 1 times r sub 2. And of course, this is a shortcut. And then you add theta sub 1 plus theta sub 2. That will be your shortcut if you are multiplying, which is the product of two complex numbers in trigonometric form. Now here on this slide, we have the, the summary of what is the formula for product, which we already went over. And so the other one is for quotient or for dividing two complex numbers. So what would you do? First, you will divide r sub 1 over r sub 2. And then the second step is going to be to subtract theta sub 1 and theta sub 2. So theta sub 1 minus theta sub 2. That's how they will go. And uh, we also have here this little um, reminder that z sub 2, our second number, cannot be equal to 0. And yes, 0 is also considered a complex number. So note that this rule says that to multiply two complex numbers, you multiply, moduli, and add arguments. So here, moduli is referring to r. So you multiply the r's, and then you add the arguments, which is the angles. And when you are dividing two complex numbers, then you divide the moduli, so the r, and then you subtract the arguments. So that's the difference when you multiply and when you divide. I think it's pretty simple. Just make sure you do have your notes handy when you do your homework and when you take your exam, of course. Okay, so example five, we need to multiply two complex numbers. So it's pretty easy. We already know that we're going to be multiplying the moduli or r sub 1 times r sub 2. So it's going to be r sub 1 times r sub 2 is going to be 2 times 8, which is 16. And second, for the angles, we're going to have theta sub 1 minus theta sub 2. And so that will be 2 pi over 3 minus 11 pi over 6. You can see that we have two different denominators. So what we're going to do is um, have the same denominator. So it's going to be 2 pi over 3. And we want it to have a denominator of 6, so we need to multiply by 2, both the top and the bottom. And then um, after that, we will add the 11 pi over 6. Now, this one, we don't need to multiply by anything because we already have the 6 that is in the denominator. So when we multiply, we have to multiply straight across. So 2 pi times 2 is going to give us 4 pi, and then 3 times 2 is going to give us 6 and then minus 11 pi over 6, and that will give us um, negative 7 pi over 6. Yes. So um, for negative 7 pi over 6, that is an, a, a negative angle. Remember, they all start here on the positive x. But then negative angles go in the clockwise direction. And so it goes a little past, uh, if this was negative pi for that particular direction, it will go pi, negative pi over 6 past pi. So that angle right there, which is negative 7 pi over 6, is actually coterminal with a positive angle and that positive angle will start again also from the positive x-axis and then it will have the same terminal side but it will go in the other direction and that is actually pi over 6 away from pi so that is going to be 5 pi over 
six. So in this case, if my if WebAssign was asking you to find a positive angle and you end up with a negative, then it's not a big deal because you should know coterminal angles. And sometimes I feel like the best thing to to remember is to draw it, even if you don't know what what you're doing. Um, but just knowing where the angle is, it it could help you a lot. So going back to this problem. So now what we have is recall the formula is uh, z1 times z2 is going to be we multiply the moduli and then we will have cosine of the theta sub 1 oh and I'm sorry here I subtracted but I'm supposed to add I'm sorry so uh, we are supposed to add so this is not even useful so sorry about that so I'm adding and 4 plus 11 that will be 15 15 pi over 6 so where is 15 pi over 6 well 15 pi over 6 is gonna be 2 pi which is 12 pi over 6 so a full rotation and then another 3 pi over 6 which actually happens to be pi over 2 so it's it's gonna be right here that is 15 pi over 6 um, what is that coterminal angle to that well it will be pi over 2 remember pi over 2 is right there so that will be helpful to find the sine and cosine because remember the points for that with respect to the unit circle will be 0 comma 1 so that tells me the cosine is 0 and the sine is 1 so let's just keep going so you add the angles the arguments that's what we call them and then I times sine of the addition of the two arguments. And this is because we're multiplying. If we were dividing, we will subtract the angle, but we're multiplying. So that plus theta sub 2. So let's go ahead and replace what we already have. So we know the product from these two numbers was 16. And then we have cosine of the addition of those two angles. And that gave us 15 pi over 6. and then plus i sine so here is the moduli and we have the angles um, theta plus one plus theta sub, sub two is uh, theta sub one plus theta sub two is five, 15 pi over six okay so now from here we will have co 16 times cosine of 15 pi over 6 so that is actually gonna be 0 and the sine well here I need I for sure but the sine of 15 pi over 6 it happens to be 1 so notice how I'm not writing cosine or sine anymore. I'm just replacing it with a number. One. And. Oh yeah, I'm missing that. The 16 is multiplying both. I keep forgetting that. So don't do that. Uh, so in this case, 16 times 0 is just 0. And then 16 times i is 16. I. So in this case, our complex number has a real part of zero, so we could refer to it as a pure imaginary. It's still complex, it just happens to have um, a real part that is equal to zero or like no real part, so that's why we call it pure imaginary. Okay, now to check our solution, we will have to write the trigonometric form of each complex number back in standard form. And so for the first complex number, z sub 1, after calculating the cosine of 2 pi over 3 and the sine of 2 pi over 3 and distributing the two, we get to this number that we have here. And it is... 4 square root of 3 for the real part minus 4i. 
Oh, sorry, that's the second one. Here's the first one, negative 1 plus square root of 3i. The second number, by following the same steps, uh, we will get 4 times square root of 3 minus 4i. And so if we do multiply those two numbers, um, just to check, we will get 1 times negative 1 times that, so it will be negative 4 times square root of 3. Then negative 1 times negative 4i, so it will be positive 4i. And then um, here we will have the square root of 3, 3i times the square root of 3. So the square root of 3 by itself will cancel out to just be 3. And then we will have a 4, this 4, and then i, of course. So, and then finally, it will be that number times this number. So it will be negative 4 square root of 3, i square. And remember how any i square, we have to replace it with a negative 1. Here we combine like terms from here, 3 and 4, that's 12. So 4 plus 12 is 16, so plus 16i. And then minus is here, but however, the i square will turn that into a positive. And now you can see that we have opposite numbers. Opposite signs, they cancel out, they are equal to zero, so we just end up with the imaginary 16i, which is what we got here for our answer. Okay, so the powers of complex numbers. So the trigonometric form of a complex number is used to raise a complex number to a power. In this example, you could see the number being raised to the second power. And then on the third example, you could see the same number being raised to the third power. So very simple, very easy shortcut. You will square the moduli because if you're squaring the number, you, so in other words, you will raise your moduli to the same power. And then for your angle, if you're squaring your exponents at 2, then you will multiply your angle times 2. That is the shortcut. For z to the power 3, you can see how the moduli is being raised to the, mm, okay, not there, but on the one below, is raised to the third power. And then the angle is being multiplied by 3. So that is the shortcut. So if we generalize this idea, and um, so let's do one more, two more. So to the power 4, you raise the moduli to power 4, you multiply the angle by 4 for both sine and cosine. And then here to the power 5, moduli times 5, and your not moduli to the power 5, and your angle times 5. So if we follow that pattern, we arrive to this theorem, the Morphs theorem, and it's named after the French mathematician Abraham de Morf. And um, sorry about the mispronunciation. So to generalize that, it will be if I'm raising up a, a, a trigonometric. Um, a complex number in trigonometric form to a power not 2 but n, then I will raise my moduli to the power n, and then I will multiply my angle times n. So n, n times theta, and then plus i sine of n times theta. So you can see how here the exponents n, the moduli powers also n, and the coefficient of the angle is n. So that is what we call the, the Morse theorem. So we're going to be applying that one. Um, so we have here seven, example seven, finding powers of a complex number. Now we're not just going to multiply this to, um, I guess, I mean, I don't want to call it binomial, but um, yeah, I guess so. Uh, 12 times by itself. We're not going to do that. Instead, we're going to convert it to trigonometric form, and then we will use this theorem because it's just way easier. So, we have this number. We will consider just what's inside the parentheses for now, and we're going to do the steps like we've been doing before. So, first we find r by finding the absolute value of the complex number. So, in this case, we're going to take the square root of the real part, negative 1 squared plus the, the square of the imaginary part, which happens to be the square root of 3. So here, something very nice will happen. Negative 1 squared is 1, and then the square root of 3 squared, like I said, it will cancel 
So we will just get 3. So now we have the square root of 4, which is 2. Remember, we only want the positive because we're talking about absolute value. So we only say 2. So now we know that r is equal to 2. So to find the angle in question, um, they don't have it here. But if I was to plot this number, It will be negative 1 for the real part and then the square root of 3 for uh, to somewhere there. So this number is going to be in quadrant 2. So our angle will go from the real part to that point and that's our angle. And so we can find it by using the formula tangent of theta is b over a. And so in this case, B is the imaginary part, the square root of 3, and A is the real part, negative 1. So if we substitute here, this is B over negative 1, we will get um, the tangent of theta is equal to negative square root of 3. And so the angle for which... Um, if we put that in, in our calculator, we're actually going to get a negative solution. It will be the negative, negative pi over 3. But we don't want that angle because that angle will be here. And that doesn't match our um, point when we plot it. So instead of using that angle, we're going to add pi because, as you notice, these two with their terminal sides are making a line. And the angle in between them, it happens to be 180, or pi radians is a straight angle. Um, so if we do that, we will find that this is 3 pi over 3 minus pi over 3. So this is actually 2 pi over 3. So that is the angle. So now we have theta is 2 pi over 3, and r is equal to 2. So remember, the question is to raise that number to the 12th power. So first, we need to write it in trigonometric form. So here we have the number already written in trigonometric form. Here is r. Remember, r was equal to 2, and theta was equal to 2 pi over 3. So for this part, we need the um, real parts right here. The imaginary part is right here. So now to raise that number to the power 12, here's the exponent here was the original question we will take that exponent distribute it to the moduli which is r2 so that we have 2 to the power 12 and then what we do is we multiply the angle not raise the angle to the power 12 but just simply multiply it by 12. so here um one thing you can do on your calculator you could calculate 2 to the power of 12 and you would see it's 4096 and that is why we have that number there 2 to the power 12 happens to be this big number here now the angle if you multiply 12 times 2 pi and then divide by 3 um, you can see how 12 times 2 is 24 so this will be 24 pi over 3 and if you divide 24 by 3, you will get 8 pi. So where is 8 pi located at? Well, it's going to be one full circle, that's 2 pi. Another full circle, that's 4 pi. Another circle is 6 pi. And another circle is 8 pi. So 8 pi happens to be um, the terminal side lands on the positive x-axis. So at that particular point, just like with the unit circle, the coordinates of that point happen to be 1 comma 0. So the cosine at for 8 pi is going to be 1, just like we see here. And the sine of 8 pi is going to be 0, just like we have it here. So in this case, 1 plus 0 is 1, and then 4096 times 1 is just simply 4096. And so, yeah, we went from an imaginary number being raised to the power 12, and at the end, we just get a simple real number.
Now, to find the roots of complex numbers, we know that a con uh, consequence of the fundamental theorem of algebra is that a polynomial equation of degree n has n solutions in the complex number system. So, for example, the equation x to the power 6 uh, equals 1 has 6 solutions. And in this particular case, you can see the 6 solutions by factoring. And the solutions uh, actually repeat. They're not unique or it might happen that some are imaginary and some are real, but if we consider all of them, and that's why we use the word complex, because when we say complex, we include the real and the imaginary ones. So considering all of those, we will have at least six. Um, so here, consequently, the solutions are, um, the, and those solutions come from these factors here, so what happened first is this 1 moved across the equal sign, so now it's a minus 1. If we factor this as a difference of squares, it will be x to the power 3 minus 1 times x to the power 3 minus, plus 1, because they're both perfect squares, meaning you can take the square root. Um, so the 1 here is a difference of cubes, and the way to factor that one is here. And the way to factor the other one, a sum of cubes, is here. So we get four factors and if we equal each factor to zero we could find that x is equal to one and from here we could see that x is equal to negative one and so that those are the first two that we have listed here the easy ones now for the other two factors um quadratic square the quadratic formula had to be used and so in that case, we ended up with two complex solutions, um, but in fact, there are four because they include the positive and the negative, and similar for this. So if we consider that, we have two solutions here, two solutions here, two solutions here. So the total of solutions or roots um, happens to be six, which is the same as the degree of the um, polynomial. Okay, so each of these numbers is a sixth root of one in general, and nth root of a complex number is defined as follows. So if we do have a complex number, again, of the standard form a plus bi, and then we have to find the nth root of the complex number z, um, then and that will be here we're just replacing u with the standard form a plus bi and then he, here this n is representing um, a number so we have here two complex numbers and by using the morph's theorem um, and the fact that we know that u sub n is equal to z. Um, here, this u, you can see it here. Uh, we have this formula. We're not going to derive it because I'm already, my video is too long already. Um, so we have s to the power n. So this s that comes here, from here. Cosine n, just like we did before. And we multiply that so the moduli gets raised to that power and then the angle gets multiplied by that number not raised to the power but just multiply so we have it here and here and so um just similar to that if we are saying that um uh, so this will be our new r and then from here from n times that angle which is called beta uh, we're just calling it here a different name, theta. And then same thing here, the angle n times beta is here theta, and you can see how sine and cosine remain the same. Okay, so I'm not going to read this whole slide. You could just pause it and read it on your own or just like skip it. Um, this is how we're substituting what we had before, the end times beta for theta you can see it here and here so it follows that we get this two equations 
So this part equals this part, and then this part equals this part. So we have that here, and here we're just using um, the sine in beta or sine theta without the i. Um, because both sine and cosine have a period of 2 pi, these are two equations, this uh, last two equations have solutions, if and only if the angles differ by a multiple of 2 pi. So it follows that there must exist an integer k such that that angle times n and beta is uh, equal to theta plus 2 pi k because of the period of sine and cosine is 2 pi. So similar to when you were doing um, equations, solving trigonometric equations, and you had to leave it in general form, you will add plus 2 n pi. So similar to that, now you can see how the n is multiplying here to beta. So to solve for beta, we will take the n across the equal sign and it will be dividing. And so that is how we arrive to this angle, to what it needs to be done to take an nth root of a complex number. So you could see the angle here and here. And now instead of raising the moduli to a power, we're going to be taking the, the root, the nth root of that, um, of R, of, of the moduli. Now here K, like we said, K was a number. K is an integer, actually. Um, so K will start at zero. So in uh, 0, 1, 2, and all the way to one integer less than the type of root we're taking. So if we're talking about the 20th root, we will stop at n equals 19. If we're talking about the 54th root, n will stop, n minus 1 will stop at 53. And so Let's see how we will apply this formula. Um, before that, let's just agree on what's going to happen here with the um, angle. So if we were to follow this path, uh, and we know that k is positive, a positive constant, then the roots begin to repeat every 2 pi. So if those two constants, k and n, are the same, the angle that we have here, remember we just said that the constant here that used to be represented with k is the same as n, so now we're just rewriting it. So um, we will have, remember that n divides theta, so that's what we have here, but um, n also divides this one, and so 2 pi n over n it will just equal to 2 pi. So that is what will happen. So uh, that angle is going to be coterminal because it just keeps repeating every 2 pi or every rotation. So therefore, they will have the same terminal side and we refer to them as coterminal. And even if k was to be 0. The formula for the nth roots of a complex number z has a nice geometrical interpretation. And you could see that here, and it will be at uh, 2 pi n. And so every point that you see here on the circle, it represents one of the roots of this complex number. Note that because the nth roots of z all have the same magnitude, they all lie on a circle. So the radius is the same, the magnitude is the same, and the center is for all is at the origin. Furthermore, because successive nth roots have arguments that differ by 2 and pi, and 2 pi over n, the nth roots are equally spaced. So all of them are spaced by 2 pi divided by n. So n tells you like how you will divide your circle. You have already found the six roots of 1 by factoring and using the quadratic formula. Example 9 shows how you can solve the same problem with the formula for the nth roots. So let's see. Um, we're going to be finding the three cube roots of z equals negative 2 plus 2i. So first, we find r, 
we need that and then second we will find theta for for most of the problems in this section that's how you will start so recall the negative 2 comes from here and we're going to need the square root of negative 2 squared so negative 2 squared is positive 4 and then the positive 2 it comes from here 2 squared is 4 so this is going to turn into the square root of 8 and we could leave it like that or we could say 8 is the same as 4 times 2 so if we take the square root of 4 is a 2 we take it out and then the other 2 stays inside so that will be the simplified version of the square root of 8 now for theta we're going to take b which is the imaginary part positive 2 divided by a which is negative 2 and this will give me negative 1 now there are two quadrants for which the tangent is negative and that will be quadrant 2 and quadrant 4 and but if we plot the point that will come from a and b it will be negative 2 comma 2 so that's gonna be 1 2 1 2 so we're talking about a point in quadrant 2 so then what makes sense for the angle if you were to type in tangent of negative 1 you would probably on your calculator actually let me show you so we're gonna put tangent of negative 1 invert tangent inverse and you will get a negative angle negative 45 we don't want a negative angle instead because negative 45 is here we don't want that it makes no sense we want the angle and second quadrant so it's going to be negative pi over 4 what you got from your calculator you add pi and that will give you negative pi over 4 plus 4 pi over 4 so it will be 3 pi over 4 and that is theta and remember r is equal to 2 times the square root of 2. So I just noticed on the next slide they left the degree, uh, the degree, the angle in degrees. So that is 135. Uh, also, if you were to have what we got on the calculator, negative 45 plus 180, which is pi, that's how you can find that it is 135 degrees and then for r they're actually using the square root of 8 which is kind of weird for um web assigned but maybe they have a reason so now if we turn that number now that we know that r is the square root of 8 so you could see that here and we know that theta is 135 so we have it in both places and um so that will be the same number these two numbers are the same. One is in standard form, complex form, and this is in uh, trigonometric complex form. So now if we apply the formula that we had previously, and I'm actually going to write it down.